Good morning. It is the um, mornings of the 21st and 22nd, Thursday and Friday. Okay, so here's what we're doing today. Um, we're going to look at these two movie monologues, and we're going to identify the persuasive strategies that they used, and we're going to judge them and make sure, you know, are they good arguments or are they bad arguments? Uh, or what is good about them, what is not so good about them. Um, and we're also going to answer some questions over these. So I'm going to show you some examples of these things taking place, and we will go from there. Um, okay, so the very first thing that we have is uh, the Dr. Jed Hill quote. This is a speech made from a movie where he says, I am God. Uh, so let me just kind of give you some background on it. Okay, so what we have here is, uh, this is uh, Dr. Jed Hill on the left, and he is being sued for malpractice. This woman, Tracy Safian, uh, she, had, uh, she had what looked like cancer on her ovaries, and Dr. Hill went ahead and removed her ovaries, and it turned out that it wasn't cancer, um, so he made a big mistake. And so she's suing him now, for malpractice. And so they're at the deposition, which is where they try to iron things out before going to trial. And one of the lawyers asks Dr. Jed Hill, he says, um, when it comes to being a surgeon, do you have a God complex? And this is Dr. Hill's um, response to that. And I'm telling you, this is one of my favorite speeches. It almost makes me want to go into medicine so I can someday say this speech. But anyway. Really cool. Uh, so let's take a look at what we have here. So he says, the question is, do I have a God complex? Which makes me wonder if this lawyer has any ideas to the kind of grades one must receive in college to be accepted to a top medical school. Or if you have the vaguest clue about how talented someone must be to lead a surgical team. I have an MD from Harvard. I am board certified in cardiothoracic medicine and trauma surgery. I have been awarded citations from seven different medical boards in New England, and I am never, ever sick at sea. So I ask you, when someone goes into that chapel and they fall on their knees and they pray to God that their wife doesn't miscarry or that their daughter doesn't bleed to death or that their mother doesn't suffer acute neural trauma from post-operative shock, who do you think they're praying to? Now you go ahead and read your Bible, Dennis, and you go to your church and with any luck, you might even win the annual raffle. But if you're looking for God, he was in operating room number two on November 17th and he doesn't like to be second guessed. You want to know if I have a God complex? Let me tell you something. I am God. Okay. So, um, what we have here is uh, we have an argument being placed. He was asked a question, when it comes to being a surgeon, do you have a God complex? And the first thing that he does is, that he, does is he mentions, do I have a God complex? Like he actually repeats the question. You know, a lot of times when we repeat a question that was asked to us, it's like we can't believe the question was asked. There's some sort of, it's like the audacity of asking that question. And maybe this is a sign of that. And then he says, which makes me wonder if this, and look at this ellipses here, it's pause right before the word lawyer. And I really think that the, what this does is this shows that Dr. Hill, since he is a surgeon, he even looks down upon the role of a lawyer. Uh, he sees that being a doctor is more important than being a lawyer, which is very ironic because I think that when you look at the professions that are some of the most respected professions. And, you know, I think any parent would be proud to say that my kid is a doctor, my kid is a lawyer. Um, and here he is like, he looks down on the lawyer. As any ideas, the grades one must receive in college to be accepted to a top medical school, how talented to be uh, to lead a surgical team. I have an MD from Harvard, I'm board certified. I've been awarded citations and I'm never sick at sea. So what I would look here, what I would look at here is I would say that all of this right here is an example of ethos or ethics.
credibility. Okay. So all of that is ethos, which is ethics and credibility. Look at how good I am. Look how talented I am. Look how many times I've been awarded. How dare you sue me? And then I really like this part here because he says, so I ask you, when someone goes into that chapel and they fall on their knees and they pray to God, so it's like he's using imagery here. And he's also putting the lawyer in the role of being somebody that they might possibly be someday. I mean, we're all susceptible to going through some sort of medical emergency in our lives, whether it's us or whether it's the person that we care about. So he starts to paint this very graphic image of the fact that at some point in time, you're going to go into the chapel and you're going to pray to God that whoever is going through whatever they're going through in your family, that they're going to be okay. And, you know, so he sits there and he, he uses right here, he uses imagery and he uses um, a rhetorical question. And of course, a rhetorical question is not meant to be answered. So of course, it begs the question, who do you think you want in there? And I also wanted to point this out. Notice here he says wife, daughter, mother. You see that? Okay, so these are all women. So he's appealing to male lawyer by describing what the women may go through. And of course, what this does is this really, uh, this really kind of tugs at the heartstrings of any, any good man, because, you know, I think that generally speaking, it's typical for men to want to protect the women. And so for him to kind of point out that it's the wife or the daughter or the mother, um, that automatically appeals to this idea that men are supposed to take care of women. And so it paints a, a more clearer picture, a more vivid picture of what this guy's talking about. And then he sits there and he's just like, and this is almost a counter argument in a way. It's like, go ahead and read your Bible. Like, yeah, it's like, yeah, there is an idea that there's this higher power uh, that we call God and he controls things. But if you're looking for God, he was in operating room number two. So this is sort of a, I mean, in a way, it's kind of a counter argument if you look at it. Um, so what we have here is we, you know, counter argument. And then he closes it with, you want to know if I have a God complex? Let me tell you something. I am God. And notice how, you know, it's uh, it's stressed right here. I am God. It's not I'm God. It's I am God. Uh, the person that you are always referring to, that's not God. That's me. And you better be grateful that I'm as talented as I am. So, you know, what we have here is, uh, you know, we definitely have... Um, when he's doing this whole idea of, you know, we have ethics and credibility up here, but then we also have an emotional appeal, okay? So this right here is also an emotional appeal. All of this, it's emotional. I'm going to talk about the women in your life having uh, having to go through something horrible, and I'm the person who's going to get them out of it. So uh, this is really very interesting. Uh, you know, I love the fact that he kind of offers his credentials, like, let me tell you how good I am, and then let me paint this picture for you, how you're going to need me with all of my credentials. And I find this very interesting. I did want to point out a couple things. Um, when he says uh, citations from seven different medical boards in New England, this right here is indicative of um, New England is the hotbed of the world's best um, doctors. A lot of doctors that were uh, the best, they went to Johns Hopkins in Maryland. They went to uh, Harvard Medical School. Uh, they went to all the Harvard, they went to all the medical schools that are up there in the Ivy League colleges in that New England area. And so a lot of them, of course, have, you know, they, they did residency and they, they got their jobs in New England. And so New England is the hotbed of, um, of the best surgeons. As a matter of fact, I had a nephew 
they had to fly him to Boston to to deal with a specialist. And, you know, that's just kind of par for the courts. You know, if you want the best, then you go to New England because that's where they're going to be. And so for him to say that I've been awarded citations from medical boards in New England, it's like, you know, he's, he's not talking about just citations from any podunk uh, hospital. He's talking about the best. So this is very, um, very interesting. Okay. Um, anyway, so if I was to answer some questions about this, then what I would do is I would um, pull up something here. Forgot to. Okay. So take a look at this. Okay. This is kind of a, a way that you're going to do this. Um, Dr. Hill has a lot of respect for the lawyer. The best surgeons are here in New England. Um, I love this when he kind of starts painting all of these medical procedures and he says acute neural trauma from post-operative shock. I have no idea what that means. And so he uses this, what we call esoteric language. Esoteric language is language that's only understood by a few. So for instance, when doctors talk to each other or nurses talk to each other, you know, and I'm overhearing that, it's more than likely it's going to be way over my head because they're going to be using a lot of terminology that I have no idea what it is. So I love the fact that he puts this in his emotional appeal because it's like, not only do I know more than you and am I, am I more talented and, and more intelligent than you are, but look at the words that I know that you have no idea what I'm talking about. And I really like how he kind of threw that into the uh, emotional appeal here. The credibility is all up here. You know, top medical school, talented elite surgical team, MD from Harvard, uh, board certified, awarded citations, never sick at sea. This is an expression that means that I can handle pressure. When I go out on sea, I don't get seasick. Um, you know, so again, then we kind of wrap it up with ethics. If you're looking for God, he was in operating room number two, and he doesn't like being second guessed. I am God. So he really does kind of finish it off with this good boom, and, and we really do appreciate that. Okay, so that's the Dr. Jed Hill quote. Now let's take a look at The Few Good Men. Um, okay, A Few Good Men is a movie about two Marines, Lance Corporal Dawson and Private Downey. They assault this guy, Private Santiago. Private Santiago was a Marine, and he wasn't a very good one. He actually, he was not a good Marine at all. He was, um, he was slow. He, he couldn't finish a run without collapsing from exhaustion. And he was getting the platoon into a lot of trouble. So what ended up happening is Lance Corporal Dawson and Downey, they went and they assaulted Private Santiago and he died from that assault. So they're on trial uh, for assaulting and killing this guy. Um, Lieutenant Kathy is their lawyer and he has this, idea that it wasn't their idea to assault Private Downey. It was Colonel Jessup, their commanding officer. He gave them orders to assault him, which pretty much kind of gets them off the hook and makes him the person that should go to prison. So in the, uh, in the, uh, in the trial, Lieutenant Caffey tells Colonel Jessup, I want answers. And he says, you want answers? And Colonel Jessup's like, uh, he's like, what do you want? And Kathy says, I want the truth. And Colonel Jessup says, you can't handle the truth. And then he goes into this long monologue, which is a very famous monologue. So let's take a look at this one. Okay, he says, son, we live in a world that has walls and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. Who's going to do it? You? You, Lieutenant Weinberg? I have a greater responsibility than you can possibly fathom. You weep for Santiago and you curse the Marines. You have that luxury. You have the luxury of not knowing what I know. That Santiago's death, while tragic, probably saved lives. And my existence, while grotesque and incomprehensible to you, saves lives. You don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. We use words like honor, code, loyalty. We use these words as the backbone of a life spent defending something. You use them as a punchline. I have neither the time nor the inclination to explain myself to a man who rises and sleeps under the blanket of the very freedom that I provide and then questions the manner in which I provide it. I would rather you just said thank you and went on your way. Otherwise, I suggest you pick up a weapon and stand a post. Either way, I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. 
Okay, so um, now what we have here is we have, he says, we live in a world that has walls. So the first thing that he does, well, actually, the first thing he does is he calls him son, okay? Which, you know, if I'm talking to somebody and I call them son, that automatically puts them beneath me. So it's sort of like a little bit of condescending. And then he says, we live in a world that has walls, and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. So right away, he starts bringing up this idea that, you know what, our world has boundaries and needs protection. And I provide the protection. I protect you. How dare you accuse me of committing a crime? Who's going to do it? You? You, Lieutenant Weinberg? So it's kind of like, you know, I'm a Marine and I fight for this country. You're in the Navy and you're a lawyer. You don't do any fighting. So are you going to be the one that's ever going to do that? I have a greater responsibility than you can possibly fathom. Okay, so right here we have ethics, credibility. You weep for Santiago and you curse the Marines. You have that luxury. You have the luxury of not knowing what I know. Ethics and credibility. Santiago's death while tragic probably saved lives. My existence, while grotesque and incomprehensible, saves lives. My existence saves lives. Ethics. You don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about it. Parties, you want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. Notice the repetition of sentence structure here. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. So again, ethics and credibility. We, the Marines, we use the words like code, honor, loyalty. We use these as a backbone. We use these as a backbone of, its, of a life spent defending something. You use them as a punchline. So it's kind of like the we versus you. We, the Marines, you, a lawyer. I have neither the time nor the inclination. This is kind of an arrogant statement to make. I have neither the time nor the inclination. I don't have, you know what? You're so beneath me. I don't have time to explain to you how I protect you. I would rather you just send thank you and went on your way. Otherwise, I suggest you pick up a weapon and stand up post like I do. So once again, ethics, credibility. And then I want you to notice this, the use of an expletive. Okay, I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. Um, you know what? Expletives, of course, you know, in school, we get in trouble for that because it's just not appropriate to use it in school. But there is a reason that expletives are used. Okay, and I'm, talk I'm not talking about like, you know, your Quentin Tarantino movie where they're using them every third word. We sometimes use expletives to get our point across. You know, if I... I mean, here I am trying to like defend myself and talk about how I'm a Marine and I'm better than everybody here. And how dare you question me and the orders that I give? Uh, you know what? I don't really care what you think. Does that really strike a chord or would it be more like, I don't give a D what you think you are entitled to? Okay. The expletive sometimes adds extra emphasis and that's very important. Okay. So here's what it would look like. Okay, so we have sun, which is condescending. Um, the walls, that means protection and boundaries. Uh, who's going to do it? You, you, Lieutenant Weinberg. That's a rhetorical question because, you know, he knows that they're never going to defend the country. They're going to be lawyers. Um, I have a greater responsibility than you can fathom. Of course, this is ethos, not knowing what I know. My existence saves lives. Arrogant ethos. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. Ethos. We, we, you, the kind of juxtaposition of the we versus you, the blanket of the very freedom that I provide. Of course, this is a metaphor. And, you know, when he says you have that luxury, you have the luxury of not knowing what I know. It's convenient for you because you don't know the things that I know. Um, and then I kind of noticed this right here. It's like when he's talking about Private Santiago, he kind of mentions, you know, that Santiago, uh, his death even though it was tragic, which this is a, a kind of a, a concession here. Wasn't Santiago's death tragic? Yes. And I'm going to acknowledge that. Santiago's death, while tragic, saved lives. Okay, so there's your refute. Concession, refute. 
So it kind of shows that there's a value of his and the Marines' lives over one, which is, of course, Santiago and, of course, the lawyer. So what we did, what we would end up doing is when we answer questions over these, this is what we're going to be doing. You're going to answer these questions in complete sentences. What does it mean to have a complex? Okay, when they ask Dr. Deadhill, do you have a God complex? Well, you know, I would Google that. I would look it up. A complex is a state of behavior. So do you behave like your God? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what's the first thing Dr. Hill does when he repeats the question? Uh, he repeats the question that's asked. What is the reason for doing this? Dr. Hill intends to show that the question is, and then you finish out that question, or excuse me, that answer. What is the purpose of the ellipsis before the word lawyer? The ellipsis means that there is a pause. The pause shows a contempt for the lawyer. A contempt is... Um, okay, and then look at let's look at a Jessup uh, question. Son, who is he referring to? Is it his son? How do you know? Jessup is referring to Lieutenant Caffey. Caffey, it is not his real son. What is the point of referring to whomever as son? Jessup is condescending to him by calling him son. So right away, we're starting to see some of the argumentative strategies that are being used here. And uh, it's going to be your job to answer these questions in complete sentences. And just make sure that there's a, a subject and a predicate, okay? A subject and a verb. Um, anyway, uh, so this is the uh, video for this assignment. I hope that this helps. And uh, if you have any questions, email me.